This is Buffalo State Data Talk, the podcast where we introduce you to how data is used and explore careers that involve data. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Buffalo State Data Talk. I am your host, Heather Campbell, and we appreciate you joining us for episode four. Today, we will be talking to Bill Bauer, the Education and Diversity Director at BioXFL NSF Science and Technology Center at Hopman Woodward Institute biomedical research organization located in Buffalo, New York. Thanks for joining us today, Bill. Why don't you start us off by telling us about, in general, what kind of work Hopman Woodworth Institute does? So Hopman Woodworth Medical Research Institute, or HWI, is a nonprofit organization that's focused on foundational research. Uh, This means that we're most interested in figuring out how things work at the very fundamental level, at the atomic scale. Our specialty is in structural biology, so this means that we study structures of biologic molecules like DNA or proteins. And these are really important molecules because they are the molecular machines of our bodies that keep everything running and keep us alive. And uh, are usually involved as some type of disease. So if you're interested in a disease, it's usually caused by a malfunction of a protein of some type. Um, So if we're better able to understand how these proteins work, we can have a better idea of how to treat these specific diseases that they're involved in. So specifically, you're part of the BioXFL Technology Center. Um, Can you talk about what this stands for and what work is specifically done by that center? Yeah. So BioXFL stands for Biology with X-ray Free Electron Lasers. And it's actually a science and technology center that's funded by the National Science Foundation and managed by HWI in Buffalo. We often use x-rays to study these very small proteins. Uh, An x-ray free electron laser, or an XFEL, is a very intense, very fast type of x-ray. In fact, these are now the brightest x-ray sources in the world. It's the center's responsibility to generate new technologies and methods that will enable researchers around the world to take advantage of these new types of x-rays and then use them for their own research. So um, I'm assuming this must be kind of like how we figured out the structure of DNA by taking x-ray photos. Is this a similar idea? Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's exactly the same thing, uh, only with much more advanced technology. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for telling us about your background. So as the Education and Diversity Director, what are your main job responsibilities? All right, so I create and manage all of the center's education and diversity programs. And we have a lot of them. We have internships, fellowships, workshops, professional development events, and conferences. So I run all of these programs and then write up the reports on them. So now that you've talked a bit about your responsibilities and what the Institute does, um, could you tell me a bit about what a typical day or week would look like for you? Yeah. Um, So it it looks like a lot of emails, um, particularly now that I've been working from home so much. Um, I spend a fair amount of my time checking in on the students and making sure that they're getting the proper support they need and making sure that they are still considering their own career advancement and helping them out with with that aspect of it. So it sounds like you help with organizing a lot of personal development, um, but do you get the chance to spend any time working on your own personal development? Yeah, good question. Um, so I do spend most of my time organizing events for other people, but I do occasionally get the chance to do this for myself too. Um, most recently, I went to a workshop on diversity training in Buffalo, and I do participate in workshops uh, typically when they're a part of a conference. And so I'll sign up for whatever looks interesting to me and do that on the side of the conference that I'm going to. So a lot of conferences are known to have specific, you know, happy hours or time for networking. So do you have any um, suggestions or tips for students while networking? Because I know a lot of students get really nervous when they're thrown into a networking event and aren't really exactly sure how to connect with people. Right. That's true. Uh, I do have a lot of tips for them. So this is something that we focus a lot on in our internship programs. Uh, It's been really difficult lately for obvious reasons. We no longer have live events to go to. Um, But there are still opportunities to network online. Uh, For example, I ask all the interns to create a LinkedIn account when they first start with the internship program. And then ask them to connect with me on there and then find people in my network 
that they may be interested in contacting and I can virtually introduce them through LinkedIn. It may be more awkward this way, um, but it may be the best that we can do at this time. Um, a lot of networking can also be done through email or through Twitter, or you can find groups that have similar interests and find people uh, that may be willing to help you. Uh, but I think the best way to do this virtually is, um, or at least start out and learn more about this, is to watch this video that we had all of our summer interns watch this summer. Uh, this is a seminar run by Elena Levine and was sponsored by the American Chemical Society. Uh, or ACS. And I'd recommend that everyone watch this. You can find this video on the ACS website. It's very useful. We can add the link to the description of the episode. As a part of your position, um, you work with both undergrads and graduate students, um, and you do a lot of mentoring of these students. Um, so as a student looking for a mentor, what would you recommend um, they look for in somebody and what kind of questions would you suggest that they're asking? Yeah, so I have a few recommendations here, but it depends on where they're looking. So if this is someone who they already know, it's probably the best and easiest scenario. Uh, they can email them directly or call the person and explain what it is that they're trying to accomplish and then explain why they think that this person might be able to help them achieve their goals. If they haven't met them before, it could still work out this way, but it, they may not be as inclined to help if this is a blind email. Uh, there are other resources out there that can help connect people with mentors that have faced similar challenges as the students. There's uh, something called the National Research Mentoring Network, or NRMN. And they have a mechanism to connect people and then guide them through a step-by-step -step mentoring process. Um, so if you don't have any suitable mentor mentors available to you, uh, this is probably the better way to go. That's a great suggestion, and we can also add that link to the description of the episode. Could you tell me a little bit about some of the projects that the BioXL staff and students work on and the data analysis they did, that they do on this research? Sure. So all of them are working on a particular protein that they're interested in. Um, some of them are working on things like photosystem, uh, which is the protein complex that's responsible for harvesting light and turning it into energy. Um, some of them are working on um, something called GPCRs, G-protein coupled receptors, which are common drug targets. Um, and regardless of which target they're working on, they're all interested in using the X-ray free electron lasers to study them. And so most of them are using this to look at the dynamics of the protein. So this means looking at how they're actually moving uh, or how they're interacting with substrates with other proteins. And we're able to use this information to construct something like a movie so we can watch these things happen, um, watch the changes happen over time um, when these particular changes happen. So once they figure out the structure of one of these molecules, what exactly is it that you can do once you have that data? All right, good question. So, <clears throat> um, with, so it depends on what you're looking for, really. Um, so this could be something like um, looking for more insights into how to design a drug to shut down the protein. You could be looking at particular mutations that are known that are um, shown to cause issues with the protein that leads to the disease. And if you know exactly where that mutation, where that change in the protein is, you'll have more information on how that affects the function of the protein. Um, some people just want to know what it looks like so they can better study it. So everyone that works with a protein um, in any field wants to know what the structure looks like because then they can more rationally design uh, their own experiments. So they can see where the active site might be, where the actual chemistry is happening inside the protein and then make mutations to it to see what the effects are. So the people that are analyzing these X-ray data that you have versus the person who's actually taking the protein and, and putting it into the machine. Are they the same person, different people? Do they have the same backgrounds? No, no. So we have really interdisciplinary teams working on these projects. It takes a lot of people to run an experiment in an expo. Um, so we have typically the people that are preparing the samples will have a background in structural biology or biochemistry, molecular bio, and they have to generate a lot of protein, like gram quantities of purified protein, which is a lot for people who don't know, but um, it, it would sometimes take them weeks of working 
uh, you know, straight through the night, they work in shifts um, just to generate this amount of protein. Um, and they, then they take this protein and they grow crystals of it. So maybe a different group that's working on that. And so we have to crystallize the protein so that when the x-rays hit it, it makes a diffraction pattern. Right? We, single molecules will diffract, but the signal is too weak. We can't actually detect it. Uh, not yet, but we're actually, we're getting there. We're making progress. Uh, and then we, so we have a team of people that will work on that part. And then we have a different team of people that work on sample delivery. So these people will just work on getting our sample in front of the Excel. Um, and there's, we have a lot of people in the center that work on developing technologies in that area. And uh, they often have physics or engineering backgrounds. Uh, and then we have data analysts who have, computer science or physics backgrounds. And then there's all the people who actually work in the national labs and run the x -Files. And so they have um, varied backgrounds too, uh, but mainly in physics and particle physics. So the people who are working on the data analysis side of things, did they have any background in biology or were they coming strictly from a computer science yeah. IT background and they had to learn a whole new field coming to work for the center? So everyone has to start in one of those areas, right? It's, un, it's unusual that they'll be learning computer science and biology at the same time. Uh, but what we try to do is provide cross-training experiences for all of the people that are involved so that they can learn the biology uh, while they're still doing their job as a data analyst. And it is important for them to understand, at least at a, a basic level, how all of these things work, um, because they need to communicate with the rest of their team. They have to understand what's going on. Uh, and it can be challenging because you know, there's very different backgrounds required for biology and for computer science. So um, I think I think in the end, after they go through all the programs, they have a pretty good understanding of both sides of it. So it's definitely possible for people with a strong uh, biology background to kind of move into the, the data science, data analysis, and then also people with a really strong data analysis coding background to use that to work in biology? So if, if I had to pick one, I would say it's probably easier to start in computer science and data science and then transition over to the biology side. Uh, the reason is, is that I think that's a more difficult thing to learn. It's more like a different language that you have to learn. And once you get that down, uh, you can move into really any area of science. So if you decide that you like biology, you can learn more about biology and then learn how to apply your data analysis skills towards the field of biology. Um, the great thing about computer science and um, data science is that you can apply this to virtually any type of field. It doesn't have to be just computer science, but if you decide you like environmental biology, you can, environmental science, you can go there. You can apply it to material science. You can apply it to virtually any field. So you already touched on this a little bit, um, talking about uh, what background you think students should come from if they're interested in the data science side of things. Um, but could you say maybe a little bit more specifically about what kind of skills or education you think uh, people would need to go into uh, this kind of field, um, specifically the kind of hard or soft skills that um, people might need to be working in a really data-driven field? Right. Um, so I think uh, being proficient at coding is really the best hard skill that you can develop. A lot of people I work with use Python to create algorithms uh, that we use to process data in real time as it's collected. And uh, if you can do this really well, like I said, you can apply this to virtually anything. For soft skills, I think um, being able to communicate really well on a team is really helpful for what we do. And also being flexible and being able to adapt to situations. It's very often the case that you go into an experiment thinking you know exactly how everything's going to go, and then it goes completely wrong, and you have to adapt on the fly, maybe even write new code to deal with the problem that you're facing. And I think if pe the people that can do that are really the best people on the team. Um, so I don't know how you learn that, <laughs> how you learn to be um, flexible and adapt to new situations, but it's, a, it's definitely something that's helpful. Um, we work in a really big data field, um, but also really fast data. And so our center is um, kind of unique in this way, I think, in that we have uh, a typical experiment in the Excel will we'll collect maybe one to two million images of x-ray diffraction patterns. 
uh, in a 12 hour period. And then each image or frame is about five megabytes. So that's five to 10 terabytes of raw data, um, which is typically reduced to maybe three terabytes after you do your processing. And this is just for a 12 hour shift and people often have multiple shifts too. So that's a lot of data, um, but it's also coming in really fast. And so at the x -File, we typically use in California, this one operates at 120 Hertz. And so that's 120 images per second, potentially. Um, that's so fast that like a human can't, obviously can't process that. So you have to have algorithms that are fast enough to deal with it as it comes in and either accept or reject it. Uh, it's about to get even more difficult though. Um, so the newer x -Files that are coming online, like the European x -File, they're even faster and they operate at about 27,000 pulses per second. That's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, what kind of technologies are the people using when they analyze this data? Are they using Excel? I mean, you mentioned Python, but could you mention some of the, the technologies of the programs people use? Um, so, so most of the programs that we use for data reduction and processing analysis are specific to our field. So many of them were even created by members of our center. Um, they're not something that are commercially available. We have to generate them on our own. Uh, and then once we do, we typically will make them freely available to the public. Um, three of the interns helped um, to optimize some of these programs this summer. Uh, and so they did things like created better interfaces, improved the coding so that it would run faster on a GPU, or improved the stability and reliability of the programs. Um, so this is really a, a big part of our project is uh, making the XFL more accessible, is that we have to make the programs that we use accessible. And so we make them as easy to use as we can and, um, and then distribute them to the rest of the groups. That's really cool that you guys basically make your own novel technologies to analyze yeah, your data. Exactly. This is all new cutting edge stuff and um, we're the ones that are kind of leading the way in a lot of the program development. Uh, could you talk about briefly um, a conclusion or a result that you guys found um, at the center or maybe you know, maybe the structure then helped to lead to some other discovery um, that was really important or really interesting and contributed to the biomedical field. Right. So much of what we do is linked to some type of disease or some type of cancer or diabetes or, um, and, you know, it has to be interesting in order to get funded, right? So that's kind of, um, goes without saying that we're all doing something that's, that's interesting. But I think of all the work that's been done, at least at, at HWI, the one that's been most impactful has probably been the work that was done by our founder, uh, Dr. Herbert Hoffman. Um, so, so much so that he received a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his accomplishments. And he essentially made structural biology possible by solving what's known as the phase problem. So uh, when we use x-rays to study molecules, we can only measure the intensity of the x-ray wave or the amplitude of the wave. We can't see the phase uh, or how the waves line up with one another. And so he came up with a way uh, using some math. He's a mathematician uh, that using equations that allowed us to determine the phase and then solve the structures of small molecules. Um, and he did that, all of this without using a calculator or a computer. He only had a yellow notepad and a pencil, which I think was very impressive. Wow. Uh, so he really... Um, the, the work that he did enabled the structural biology at a very uh, early stage. Uh, he's also the only person in Buffalo to have a Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, speaking of Buffalo, could you tell us a bit about how you ended up in Buffalo and why you chose to live and work here? Sure. So I was born and raised here, and so is my wife. And so we've been trying our best to stay here and raise our kids here. Uh, with our families around. Um, we certainly could have left at some point, but we really like it here and we enjoy the changes in seasons, even, even the winter. <laughs> so it's been a conscious decision just to stay in Buffalo, um, trying to make it work. Yeah. Um, assuming you've, you've lived here for a number of years, so what could you say potentially about how you feel about the environment for you know biomedical research or new companies and stuff coming in Buffalo? How has that changed recently? Uh, this has really been changing a lot. So I work on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, and they've been expanding 
Uh, there's always new companies coming in or always putting up new buildings. Um, so this is a really great time to be in Buffalo if this is the area that you're interested in. Um, most people aren't aware of the companies that are here on campus. And so we've um, been trying to promote this. And every time we have workshops, um, I've we mentioned the companies that are around here. We've even taken students on tours of the different companies and talked about what they, they do here. Um, so just trying to make people aware of the opportunities that exist and, and make sure that they have the opportunity to stay in Buffalo if they want to. So a lot of our listeners are younger and our students. So as somebody who's in a leadership role, who may have been responsible for hiring or mentoring um, new employees or young students, um, what advice would you give to somebody who's interested in working with data and has just entered this field? All right. So first I would tell them that they've made a good decision. Um, so we are always in need of, of new data analysts. And they're very hard to come by and, um, you know, we always are looking for people who are interested in this and good at it. Um, the first thing that they should work on is getting a good foundation in programming, like I said, in at least one language, but potentially more. Uh, most computer science programs will have some type of com coding component to it that will include like artificial intelligence, machine learning, or image processing. And all of that is great. The earlier you can get that, the better. But if your program doesn't include things like this, I would recommend looking outside of the program to get experience and training in these areas. Uh, and once you're comfortable with this, then we can do what we were talking about before and going out and to find other areas of research that are interesting to you and trying to apply your skills to that, that different area. Um, there's a lot of other programs out there. So Buffalo has one called the Coder School. So if you're looking for an introduction to Python coding, um, this is an actual physical location you can go to, but they also have remote learning now where you can sign up for workshops that will train you on how to um the code in python and um even apply this to things like minecraft and roblox and um, other popular gaming platforms yeah so we can add the link to the coder school in the description for this episode so finally before we let you go um is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know that we didn't get a chance to cover today um i think one thing I should emphasize is that the best way to get started on your career is with internships. Uh, it's a great way to try out different fields and figure out what you like. So this should be a priority for every student uh, every summer that they have the opportunity to use. Applications for these are typically open in the fall and close in January or February. So you should consider looking for these soon. Um, and uh, I'm running a bunch of these internship programs too. So maybe we can link those. Definitely. We'll, we'll add that in the description too. But even if it's not one of mine, um, there's a lot of online resources that can help you find internship programs that you're interested in. Great. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. And to all of our listeners, if you have not already, check out our previous podcasts available wherever you listen to podcasts. And for more information about starting your career as a data scientist, go to dataanalytics.buffalostate.edu. And don't forget to subscribe so that you get a notification each time we release a new episode. And join us on the first of every single month for a new episode of Buffalo State Data Talk.